All right. So today we were going to be going over career services here at SDSU and some of the information and kind of the general setting that we're in here in Southern California, so close to the border, and uh, especially during a pandemic where there is a lot of cross collaboration happening. And then I will be introducing the amazing panel that we have today um, to talk about their journey highlights and strategies to be successful as a new professional or continuing professional. We will also be sharing some tangible resources for you, particular as students, if you are interested in internships abroad, working abroad, whether you are here in the US or you are in Mexico, as well as some international resources for those who are interested in attending SDSU as an international student. And lastly, of course, we will leave some time for questions from the audience. So please, as the panelists share information that spark a question, please feel free to include those in the chat as well. All right. Now, I myself am Natalia Petticourt. I am the Career Development and Program Coordinator for the College of Health and Human Services and the College of Education here at San Diego State. My background is in policy administration, social work, and psychology. And with me today as my moderator is my colleague. Hello, everyone. I am Melissa Gonzalez. I am the Career Development and Diversity Engagement Coordinator. Um, so also a career counselor like Natalia, um, but I have a focus with students in the Colleges of Arts and Letters and Professional Studies and Fine Arts. All right, so just to start with this conversation, I wanted to give an overview of career development as a whole. So according to the National Association for Colleges and Employers, or NACE, there are some core career readiness competencies that students and new professionals are encouraged to develop while they're in school and as they engage in internships and career opportunities. Of course, today in this workshop, we are directly addressing career and self-development. We're having panelists to talk about how to be proactive in developing yourself, your interests, your awareness of your strengths. They will definitely be sharing more about how they have progressed throughout their careers in the public health and mental health fields. Communication is also something that is very critical in um, as, a, as a new professional, as a continued professional. Um, today we are talking about the border population. And so, and as of course this uh, conference is both in English and Spanish, being bilingual or trilingual or multilingual is such a added value for you as a professional to be able to serve a larger population. Critical thinking, identifying and responding to the needs and basic understanding of situational context. Of course, critical thinking is absolutely necessary for the mental health and public health fields to solve the many complex problems our society is facing today. Equity and inclusion, the awareness and knowledge of how to engage and include people from different local and global cultures. Of course, something that we are addressing um, within this context of the conference. Leadership and professionalism, right? Recognizing and capitalizing your team and your strengths, as well as understanding effective work habits and interest in the larger community and workplace, teamwork and technology, building collaborative relationships, working well with other folks, and also understanding and leveraging technology technology to effectively support your community in the work that you do. So we typically recommend um, these core competencies to students to begin thinking about how their classwork, volunteer, part-time work, full-time work, um, projects, and everything helps them build these core skills to help them be most effective in working with their communities and their key, their key interests. Now, during the 2019 to 2020 academic year, there were more than 1 million international students enrolled in US institutions. And while I would argue that many college students uh, often struggle with the transition into college and graduate school, the adjustment is even more difficult for international students or students of a different culture. As career development professionals, we have an opportunity to make an environment that is inclusive and belonging for all students, including international students, to help them navigate the career development process and help them feel 
uh, confident as they begin to look for career options and opportunities outside of their education. I also want to quickly define culturally competent or cultural humility. And that is defined as those who work to build awareness around their own biases, seek to understand the worldview of their culturally diverse clients, and implement culturally appropriate intervention strategies. So this is something that we embody at SDSU Career Services, but it is a critical piece in understanding professional development amongst our international students. Another context that I want to place this very important conversation is what is happening right now during the pandemic and the health crisis at the border. There are over 70 million people living in the four Southern states that border Mexico and the US. And unfortunately, and um, sadly, the, the COVID pandemic has disproportionately impacted uh, communities of color with rates of illness and death that far exceed their representation in the population. So now more than ever, public health conversations are critical. Hearing uh, new professional voices and understanding the experiences of our students is also something that we need to take very serious as professionals working with those who are going to be the future change. Health inequity refers to the uneven distribution of social and economic resources that impact the individual's health. Often in this field of public health, we talk about the social determinants of health and how many different ways us as individuals can impact the health sector um, beyond just research or beyond just education. You can look at community building and how cities are structured to better support the health of all populations within that city. And so we wanna be sure that we are addressing populations who have been disenfranchised or discriminated against because of their location, because of their backgrounds, and because of um, where they might be receiving their education or where they might be receiving support. And so us as professionals, we want to be able to serve um, the students that we work with, the professionals that we work with, and as well as the communities that we are hoping to collaborate with to be able to address a lot of these complex issues. So with that being said, and with the strong partnership that we have you know, here in San Diego with the border populations, and in particular, the two panelists that we have today have had a lot of experience working um, across the border and internationally to support public health initiatives. So I am gonna go ahead and introduce our two panelists today. With us, we have Leticia Casares, who is the Graduate Advisor Field Placement and Professional Development Coordinator Lecturer in the School of Public Health here at SDSU. And Dr. Patricia Lozada Santon, who is the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at SDSU's College of Education. I would like to invite uh, Leticia and Dr. Santon to please um, go ahead and share a little bit, a brief introduction of yourselves, and then we will begin um, asking some questions. Hi, my name is Leticia Casares, and I'm so sorry, but I'm having some technical difficulties with the camera. I'm still working on it, so I hope to join you uh, soon, but uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as uh, Natalia mentioned, my name, I am the Graduate Advisor um, and Field Placement and Professional Development Coordinator. I also teach uh, several classes. Right now, I am, I'm teaching uh, PH 300, which is professionalism in public health for undergrads. And really what that is, is just a, a career pathways and just career preparation with um, developing your resume and cover letter and uh, practicing interview skills and all sorts of different things. So uh, I also teach a health equity class, which uh, addresses some of the health disparities um, in public health. Um, really focusing on um, some of the um, inequities in healthcare. Uh, so definitely uh, a relevant and timely class. Um, so I look forward to talking more with you um, in the coming minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, my name is Dr. Patricia Lozada Santone. I am a faculty and assistant dean for student affairs in the College of Education. I've only done that job for about 20 years, um, but I come to you with a varied background and I come to hopefully share with all of you that it's many roads lead to Rome and why I say that to all of my students from freshmen to PhD students is 
that there's more than one way to get to your destination. And uh, we need all of you more than you can imagine in the different fields of public health and mental health uh, professions. I don't know what else you'd like me to uh, provide at this time other than I am an Aztec. I am alumni of San Diego State, very proud of it. I have three generations of Aztecs. My mother, may she rest in peace, was an Aztec and my son who is a thriving practicing master's level educator uh, in California. Um, and uh, there's a lot to be learned. Excellent, thank you so much. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with a few questions that we've prepared. But um, audience, please feel free to submit questions you have for our panelists. If you'd like to learn more about our panelists and the work that they have done, feel free to check out their bio on the Reboarder website. So to get us started, it would be great to hear from each of you, what specific role have you had that helped you get to where you are today? I, I can't say it's a specific role, but I can say that at every step of the way, from high school to college, and on to um, higher level degrees, you're learning something. And the most important thing along with the content that you're learning is the skills. I also am very um, proud, orgullosa as one would say, that I am bilingual. And being bilingual has afforded me a tremendous amount. I always say that when you hire me, you get uh, two for the price of one because my brain has the capacity and capability of thinking in both languages and communicating in both languages and uh, putting forth my profession in both languages. I wish I spoke more. I'm not fluent in other languages, but uh, the, the language of Spanish has afforded me the ability to undertake other languages such as Italian and French, all the romantic languages. So I, I wanna impress upon everybody that if you don't have a second language to go acquire one. And um, it's never too late, very important. Um, what I learned along the way uh, was the skills and abilities of other people that were I was learning from. I actually learned even from the worst of them because what I learned was that is what I will never do when I'm given the opportunity to be the one of leadership and uh, with the clients and the patients and so forth. So you learn all along the way, but the best thing I can tell you is to truly learn as you're going through your um, academic preparation because the skills and the tools you pick up are very critical regardless and what side of the border you're on, they're very important. And the more of them that you pick up, the better off you are. And for me, uh, it's a two part answer. First, I have been in, I'm also uh, an alumna of the, of San Diego State, uh, particularly, particularly the School of Public Health. Um, I born and raised here and many of my roles had to do with outreach and engagement um, with the community. So uh, most of my roles uh, was uh, included partnering with many different organizations and, and agencies uh, around the county and in California as well. So my role currently as internship coordinator uh, definitely involves partnering and reaching out to different organizations. And so I had that network already. Um, and so it prepared me for this role. Uh, the second part is how did I come to do this work for the School of Public Health uh, here at San Diego State? And I got here and was hired for this position because of the fact that I was also in the public health program um, here. And so I am familiarity with the program, with the courses and the internship requirements. So when I was hired, uh, it was a very good fit. So not only was I an alumna of the program, but I also had the partnerships um, already. And that has really helped me to uh, provide opportunities for students. I kind of want to expand a little bit more on what you have both introduced of these core skills, right? So Dr. Elizabeth Santon, you mentioned um, building these skill sets along the way, 
right to get to where you are both of you are in positions where you are managing other people where you are in higher level meetings where you are collaborating with big organizations what is something that a student can do now with their student voice to begin having those conversations in their spaces whether they are here at sdsu or at the community colleges or across the border what what i would offer is uh to get involved. Uh, what Leticia had shared about developing uh, relationships and extending themselves for a freshman, for a sophomore in, in any uh, capacity, getting involved in an organization or a club or a group, even if it's not part of your campus, but getting involved in a group where you're afforded uh, the ability of responsibility to learn how to work collectively, to learn how to listen to others, to learn how to be a team player. All of those kind of skills work all the way up to, as we see, to even our uh, government of the United States of America or, or Latin America. The whole point is that one needs to develop those skills, the skills of communication. Some of us are better orators than others, but there's many ways of communicating. Uh, the writing skills uh, in, in various languages, for that matter, in this case, Spanish and English. But all of those things, no matter what your destination is, they go with you. And the, the better you get yourself out there and try those skills and fine tune them, the better you'll be as you move through and, and go up, up, up the ladder of success. Uh, very important uh, to understand that we have to respect each other, all of us. I tell, uh, I always tell everybody what my mother said to me when I was preparing to go to medical school. She told me, you better be very, very respectful and kind to the nurses that have been there for many years and will probably know more than you do at a certain point. And she said, they can make your life a heaven or a living hell. And what I learned from that is that one must respect everyone, where one works, where one is going, because everyone has something to offer. And that's critical. And that's a skill that you take everywhere you go, regardless of what um, roles you undertake as you move through the system. Absolutely. And Leticia, I was wondering if you could share, um, I know we've worked together um, often, and you had shared with your students the critical thinking piece. So I would love if you could kind of share um, how you've seen critical thinking be such a, an important skill set that students develop in the different roles that you have had in the past. Sure, thank you. Uh, it's definitely a critical skill uh, uh, because in public health specifically, you are often having to think on your feet, um, adapt, to evolving changes and we can use the pandemic as an example. We were not prepared for that in um, the public health field or in general. And we did see a lot of chaos. Uh, so having to scramble and, you know, what, what I like to say, you know, build the plane while we're flying it uh, is literally, the, my motto in public health, because it doesn't just apply to the pandemic. It applies to just about every role in public health and what you're dealing with. Um, and so when that's the case, you have to be able to think quickly, uh, think strategically. And what that means is problem solve and have the ability to think through a problem and ask yourself, okay, what is the most important thing I need to do right now? What do I need to be able to execute this? Who do I need to help me? What should I keep in mind in terms of unintended consequences? How can my decision right now impact people now and in the future? And so what are the scenarios, the different scenarios that could occur? And once I know what those scenarios are, I can then prepare for what needs to happen so that it doesn't. Um, so that is 
in a nutshell, what I mean by critical thinking to be really thinking through different problems on your own and really trying to f- figure out who do I need to talk to if I don't have the question, the answers, who can help me answer those? Who do I need to help me? What are the different scenarios and, and how can I address any problems that arise? So in public health, that is absolutely imperative to be able to do that. And you know, the way I like to apply that or help my students understand that at today is just in your classes and looking at, say you're reading through the assignment and you don't understand it. Well, that's a problem. So what are you going to do? Are you going to immediately email the professor or are you going to maybe contact your small group that you've been assigned to? Maybe somebody in your class knows and can help you. Maybe you need to just reread the instructions a couple of times. So that's a problem that you think through. And I would just tell you that the, 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 the best choice or the, the most, uh, the choice where you're actually using your critical thinking skills would be what? What would be, what would be the answer? Somebody can either chat, put in chat. Which one would be the, the, the most, the, the response or the rea- re- reaction that um, is the most critical thinking, use it, using your critical thinking skills? The answer is, I can tell you what it's not. It's not asking your professor right away. It's, wait a minute, I have some friends in this class. I have a group that I'm assigned to. So I'm going to contact my student, my, my uh, classmate, and I'm going to see if they understand this, um, this, uh, these instructions. So that's just an example uh, that you could apply uh, here in the classroom. But in general, yes, critical thinking skills are important. Absolutely. We see this very often in career services. We get students that say, I don't know what I want to major in. I don't know what I can do with this degree. I don't know how to find a job all valid questions, it is a tough process. But then the first question I ask is, what have you done so far? What have you looked into? Have you utilized some of the resources on our website? Are you familiar with these certain platforms? And help them understand, okay, well, there are a lot of options that I can choose from first and foremost. The more detailed I can come in, the better we can progress with moving forward in how to make decisions immediately and long-term. May, may, I, may I add to that? Um, you stimulated my, my brain uh, to, to share with our audience. I think you re- recall that at the beginning, I said there's many roads that lead to Rome. There's many ways to get to your paths, but the most important one is go to the mirror and look in the mirror and, and ask the mirror, which is yourself, uh, what do I like to do on a daily basis? Do I like to be around a lot of people? Do I like to share myself with a lot of people, large audiences, large groups? Do I prefer to be on a regular basis with smaller groups? You may think that's very silly, but that's going to inform you. Right now, our subject matter is public health and mental health. In both of those fields, there is a tremendous vast range of professions and you can be in one of them, but you really do have to know yourself first and foremost. And when you can answer that question as you're going through your education, you can start to prepare the proper path for yourself. Because the reason I say that more than one path, if you love music, can you be a physician or a nurse? Absolutely. If you love art, can you be a public health and PH? Uh, person, yes, you can. You're going to have specific subject matters that have to be known to you intimately to be in the profession. But the general education of the music or the art, that is fine. So what I'm trying to say is know yourself first and foremost, and know, here we go. You want public health? 
In public health, you're going to have to know the full range of everything, including law. I never wanted to go back and get a law degree, but you got to understand law if you want to make changes. I could tell you lots of stories about that on how we made the changes in California, across the nation, and the world as it pertains to tobacco. On and on. You never realize that all the things, there's not enough time to learn them all, but understand them and know where to go to acquire the assistance. So as you're at your universities and community colleges, prepare. You want to be a doctor, an MD, a medical doctor, because I'm a doctor. I'm just not an MD. You want to be a medical doctor? Well, it takes a long time to get there, but there's a lot of stuff you can do before you get there. Why don't you become a phlebotomist and start learning how to actually take blood from people so you don't hurt them when you're in a resident or an intern? Uh, just it, it, It's just finding those steps, take advantage of the opportunities to go to observe the areas you think you want to be in. You want to be in public health? Volunteer at a public health uh, department. Volunteer for the public health areas. There's so many. Right now, we're dealing with the pandemic of immunizations and people wanting to and not wanting to take them. This is a great opportunity. There's not enough public health to go around to get that information, but internships volunteer. Now, I stop. Now, are you going to get paid for all of these? In some places you might, and in some places you might not, but the opportunities you're going to acquire the skills and information at those volunteer areas will serve you forever. And I mean that sincerely they will give you the opportunity. And the last tidbit I want you to remember always, no matter which way you go, you are always interviewing for a job or an opportunity. So you should always be at your best with everyone around you and with the people that you aren't even getting paid by when you're volunteering, because you never, ever know. And my dad used to say to me, and it's with me forever, Someone is always watching and that can be in your favor in the long run. So keep that in mind as you prepare in your careers. Absolutely. I think there's also a lot of opportunity to go beyond what I call your capital J job. What is in your job description? Uh, for example, I worked at the San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency doing and performing one specific role but I am also someone who is passionate about mental health and public health. So I ended up having the opportunity to become the president of the Live Well Committee in my office, which works at the county leadership level to do health initiatives for their employees, to boost their mental health, to boost their awareness and education of healthy eating, stress relief, meditation, yoga. So I was able to add that to the things that I did on a daily basis, right? Was it on my job description, but because I was committed to it, applied, got voted for to be the president, that was something I got to do on a day-to-day -day basis that helped me feel fulfilled and placed me at a table with a lot of people who were able to make big decisions. So while maybe that job description right when you graduate or that internship is not exactly what you'd like to be doing, but you have a lot of passion and interest and ideas in a very particular area, bring them with you. You never know where you might be able to apply those areas and who else might have those same interests, right? So sometimes thinking outside of the box can be a way for you to develop a skill set within another area or profession. All right. Another question I want to pose to our panelists as well is what are one or two challenges that new professionals, whether that be people within a couple of years in the field of public health or mental health or current students, what are the challenges that they're facing in the public health field today that you think that they can really pay attention to and tackle head on with those critical thinking skills we talked about? I can start. So I'm sorry, maybe I don't quite understand. So the are, are we talking about like emerging trends in the in public health em, employment or what do we? Yeah, so I think uh, it could be, yeah, some of the challenges that you see directly in professional development in public health fields, the emerging trends of kind of bigger issues that new public health professionals are going to need to face. What have you seen emerging that, you know, new professionals really need to be paying attention to right now? 
Okay. So number one is in the field of public health, we, it's evolving. The pandemic pretty much turned us upside down and uh, we recognize that we are going to need to not only staff up um, and invest money in the public health arena, but we need to have critical skill sets. Um, and several of those that have come to light as the future skill sets that will be more and more in demand include, you know, cultural humility, really having an open mind and uh, a willingness, a lifelong uh, learner uh, mindset and attitude where you are constantly educating yourself experiencing and exposing yourself to working with different communities. So as much experience working with diverse communities, whether they be race and racial ethnic communities, um, you know, LGBTQIA, um, refugee immigrants, foster uh, youth, homeless, that's what I mean by diverse. Um, at, with as much as, as many opportunities that you can find, whether it's volunteer or internships, I think you can be doing that now. In fact, you should be doing that now. Um, so whether you are wanting to be a uh, public health nurse or a preventive medicine doctor or a health educator, uh, you should be exposing yourself to all sorts of different communities. So it doesn't matter what position or what career path you have, you should be going out there and try and learning and understanding about all the different uh, cultures that and communities that you might be working with. And let's just uh, be, you know, honest, in the field of public health, that's pretty much everyone. That's the public. So get out there and experience yourself um, with that. The other thing to keep in mind is that it is going to be changing over the next year because some of the, the restructuring that has to happen in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic or the next um, epidemic, we have to do things differently. And so there's going to be some restructuring and some new uh, fields and new positions and professions um, that are going to be coming down the line. So start paying attention to what those are. And you can do that by joining associations like the American Public Health Association. Get on their newsletter, get um, connected and uh, participate in their conferences. Live Well San Diego, get on their newsletters, their um, uh, announcements and conferences. And that's where you're going to learn about the emerging professions. And so you stay on top of those professions, um, get the experience that you need with diverse communities. Definitely the professional development and working in those um, different uh, 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 skill sets like um, critical thinking, leadership, communication, um, teamwork, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, those are all critical skills, technology that you'll want to also uh, develop um, over the next uh, year or so while you're in school. Well, everything she said and more. <laughs> Leticia is right on. Uh, I, I would want to describe to you what a, a, a public health educator, what a public health promotion person does you have to come to the table with everything. Uh, the ability to, uh, from making uh, posters to designing uh, uh, messages through the radio, through the television, uh, the whole nine yards to get your message depending on what campaign you're working on. I, I see the struggle right now at this moment that I never experienced per se, other than it was lack of information, lack of knowing where to go to get it. If I use immunizations as an example, I personally, in my time out doing actual public health work, 
my whole responsibility was actually educating and informing and showing the way to acquire the immunizations. Right now, our public health professionals are battling an unfortunate situation of misinformation and um, politics in this arena. But politics will always be involved because when I was doing anti-tobacco, I not only had the politics against us, but I also had a huge industry and yet we won and survived to make a difference for our state of California, for our nation and for many other uh, countries. So it can be done, but you need to come have eaten your Wheaties as they say, if that's still an expression to come muscles with knowing how to do many things that I don't know how to do of your generation of working the technical software, all the different venues of communicating depending on your issue. Uh, so the more you can put, I call it the little doctor bag or the Mary Poppins bag of skills and abilities, the better off you will be uh, in your professions. Somebody asked something very interesting about, will you make money? <laughs> I also wanna to clarify too, for, for students who, you have so much on your plate right now. The expectation is not that you come having known everything and prepared to do 100% of the job. That is not necessarily what we're speaking to here. But I think what uh, Professor Casadas mentioned is being adaptable. Things are consistently changing. Um, we have had to adapt so much given the, the last you know year and a half, not really by choice, <laughs> but we've had to manage, right? And so I think what's important is to figure out small incremental ways to build a new skill set. You don't have to know everything, but you need to be willing to learn and adapt to the needs of that organization, to the needs of that community. You might have really great ideas and making sure to put that on paper, making sure to put that in a presentation that is accessible by the communities that you're serving is going to be a critical skill. I often see students who have a very high level of thinking. They've been presenting, uh, or they have been presented so much theoretical knowledge in public health and mental health and psych services, counseling, the medical profession. Now it's your turn to translate that information to what the average person on the street will understand. That is how you affect change. That is how you convince people to make choices that are in the best interest of themselves, their family, and the community. And guess what? You are already doing this in the classroom. You're already writing papers. You're already presenting arguments. You're already critically thinking. You're working in a team. You're convincing a classmate to work on a project in a particular way based off of your perspective. You're practicing these skills. So continue to find resources to connect with people and to pay attention to the skills that you're already learning in the classroom or already learning in an entry-level job because it is 100% transferable. Natalia. Uh, the young lady, Bianca, has a very powerful question uh, working and going to school. It's what you get out of the work. And, and if I may, I, uh, if you're a waitress, if you're a waiter, you're having to deal with human beings, both happy and not so happy at certain services. Those are skills. This is, this is what we want to share with you. Developing those skills will help you no matter which way you go. You want to be a mental health therapist, you're going to be dealing with people that are either happy or not happy, uh, not feeling well. How are you going to work with them? You can develop skills because you're working with the public. If you're a waitress or a waiter or you're, you're um, a receptionist with individuals in the hotel industry, Everything can be pulled from the skills you interact with the human beings. Um, you, you need to make money. Some waitressing jobs make more money than other jobs. You want to be in the medical field and interact. Maybe if you're not doing anything therapeutic in a hospital, maybe you're a bilingual receptionist. You're seeing how doctors and nurses act, how they interact. So yes, it is very difficult. Uh, to try to extrapolate out of those jobs or how you can see what it is you could pull from a job. But trust me, you can, and I'd be more than happy to. I'm 
in the directory, as they say, at San Diego State to discuss that with you. But yes, many of us have to do jobs that have not, we think, we think they have nothing to do with our future profession, but they can. It's just understanding and learning. That's why we have career services to help our young men and women. And I hope in other places they have them as well to understand that many of our skills and our abilities are transferable. We just have to realize that and understand how they transfer. Uh, the other example I wanna give you because many of you are at universities and colleges is to choose wisely on your majors of where you're going to go. Do not choose incorrectly because, and what I mean by that is, don't do it because somebody just told you you had to. That's what I'm talking about. Because what we forget is when we do that, you still need a high GPA to get into master's programs and doctoral programs. If you choose unwisely something that is not your forte or that you don't care for, you're not gonna succeed usually, usually, to acquire the highest GPA possible. Why would you wanna compete for medical school having chosen a chemistry degree and not did as well as you could have when your partner is coming in with the 4.0 when they chose music or art. They have the same prerequisites as you, but they, they chose what they had a passion for along with the courses that they needed to get in. That, that's the valuable thing I wanna get across to you all. And I say that because I'm in the College of Education. You're probably all saying, why would you be there, ma'am? You have a, you're a public health professional. You're an educator. Well, why not? In my college, I have all the therapeutic professions. You want a marriage and family therapy degree license? We have that. You want to be a counselor? We have that. I have a major called child and family development. One that's so under the, under the bridge, people don't even think about it. I have students right now in law school. I have them in nursing school, medical school, occupational therapy, special education, bilingual education. If I'm lying, I'm dying. What I'm trying to say is, please, please seek the knowledge and the information that your academic advisors have, that your career counselors have, people like myself, like Leticia, ask so that you can be successful. We need you. We need a whole reinforcement to come on in into the fields of mental health and public health, and especially if you're bilingual. Absolutely. We're gonna do one more question and then I, I wanna open it up for questions from the audience. Um, but I know students are eager to find opportunities. Uh, I see this all the time in my office. Students want jobs, they want internships, they want to get involved. Some might have more time than others. But this idea of finding an internship or finding a job or determining what grad program um, can seem overwhelming with all the other decisions that have to be made on a daily basis. So I want to start with you, Leticia, if you can share um, for looking for internships, for example, knowing that you're the internship coordinator, where do you recommend that students start to get familiar with what opportunities are out there and how they can be the most competitive candidate? That's a really good question. And, um, you know, I, I, I first want to address um, the, the question because it relates around, you know, how do I go about doing this if I work two jobs? Um, how do I get exposed? And this is an example of thinking creative, creatively um, and really you know, thinking critically uh, about what are some of those opportunities. Um, I had two jobs and I worked full-time uh, all throughout my undergraduate and master's. And I was uh, president of a couple of student clubs and I was volunteering on the weekends. Um, so there, it's a sacrifice. I completely understand, but you're not alone. This, there's many students in the, the same position. It's a sacrifice of your time. And I, you know, it, it's not easy. No one's saying that, but there are things that you can do while you, um, while you can um, and as much as possible until your hours you know, re are reduced a little bit. So one thing you can do just to start out is um, learning about the different organizations 
that are, and, and if we're talking about here in San Diego, um, which I would recommend since you're going to school here or in Mexico, in Tijuana, just really learning about the different organizations um, in your area. And you can do this a number of ways in San Diego. You can go do a simple, simple exercise. Go to 211.org. Go to 211.org. It is a um, basically a repository, a directory of all the different health and human services in San Diego. And if you look through there, you can um, you can um, search different topics. So let's say you're interested in homelessness. You can ent you can put in homelessness. And all the organizations that work with unsheltered and homeless um, populations will come up. Then you go to each of those sites and you learn about those sites, those organizations. So you can do that and learn about the local work that's being done. Um, and so that's a good start. And if you like one, then Maybe you can go to their web, check to see if they have any openings, any internships, or maybe they don't have any internship openings, but maybe they have an event coming. And maybe you can meet someone at that event that's a hiring manager. So go to an event. Maybe you don't have the time to start an internship. Go to the event, find a couple of people, introduce yourself, and you've made a connection. And you can email them and you can ask them for an informational interview, which is all that is, is just an opportunity to learn more about their career path. So you email them and say, hi, you know, so-and-so, I met you at the, you know, event last week and I'm a, a student at, you know, San Diego State and, you know, I really enjoyed talking with you. You have about 15, 20 minutes to share a little bit more about your background. So these are all ways to get exposed, to meet people, to find internships. And then you can find internships um, on Handshake. If you're a student at uh, School of Public Health, I'm the person that you can come to. Um, you know, you can ask your classmates, professors. Um, you know, there's just so many different ways, but I, I just, encourage you to think outside of the box. Um, you don't have to start an internship or get a job in the field of public health to be quote unquote exposed to the field of public health. You can join a webinar, you can go to an event, you can even, and I, I, this is another exercise you can do, Google community collaboratives in San Diego. If you Google community collabor collaboratives in San Diego, several collaboratives, and these are just groups of people from different fields of health and human services that come together and they share about their work. They share about their programs and services. And if you attend one of those meetings, and I'm sure it's either in person or virtual now, it's another opportunity to get to know the different organizations and meet people. So these are all things you can do without even putting in five, 10 hours a week for an internship. So think creatively. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I think with the students that you know we we work with and you can see it, you know, in the chat, there's a lot happening, right? And and like you said too, we have all been there. Right. I was a grad student full time and I had a part time job and a part time internship. So I had two full time things going on. Um, start small. Right. You don't need to get that nine to five job. You don't need to have all of the experience in one semester. Small incremental changes will help you get to where you need to go. You're here today. You've already taken a step. Right. You connect with one person from some session today. That's a second step right? Researching. We're going to be providing many resources uh, very shortly that you all can use to begin getting more informed about opportunities. At San Diego State, we have many. Um, 
I cannot speak to the SETI's counterparts, but even if you are across the border, you are welcome to reach out to us um, through LinkedIn and ask questions, right? Connect with your communities, ask people. And we even have that question here, which I'm gonna to get to in a second. How did you decide to your current career? And that is how, and, and that was what you wanted to do. And the short answer is I didn't. Most of us probably didn't think we would be where we are today. However, the progression of experiences that we've had, the critical skills that we've learned along the way have led us to where we are today. It is rare that the path is linear. You will have many opportunities and it is what you make of those opportunities that will help you grow into the next step and next phase of your life. I never thought about career development until I was afforded the opportunity and saw that I had many of the parallel skills that would help me be very successful in this field and the partnerships that I've built and the collaborations I've had in previous jobs. So just think about what you want to do next, not necessarily what you need to do for your entire life. Think a couple of years in advance, what you can be doing now, what jobs sound interesting, what would you like to do day to day? And then from there, once you achieve that goal, then you're setting the next goal. Of how you, and also taking time to establish your skill set and be comfortable in that new role is also absolutely appropriate. So I'm going to pass it along to Melissa to share some of these resources, and then we're going to open up that Q&A uh, for the questions that were posed today. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you to our panelists. Um, so just some, some resources that we want to share with you all, um, and we will be sharing in the chat a link so that you can access the resources as well, and everything is hyperlinked. Um, Going Global is one of those resources where you can access opportunities available around the world. Um, so that's that's a great site to look up opportunities uh, for internships. And they also have country guides where you can learn about that specific country that you're considering going to. Um, ONET Online is another great resource to research occupations, to research what's kind of what's my next move in terms of as you consider consider a particular occupation. Um, Handshake is SDSU's job search platform. Um, and there you can search for jobs and internship opportunities. Um, and there's also a filter for whether the, the employer requires work authorization. Um, and there's also a filter for CPT and OPT for our international students. Um, so that's something that you have available. If that applies to you, you would be able to search for opportunities based on those filters. Um, on our website, we also have an internship central section um, and you can find your department internship contact um, because each department on campus has their internship contact. Um, so definitely they are excellent resources. We learn from them and they learn from, uh, from us and we exchange a lot of information. Um, another resource is Parker Dewey, and these are micro internships. These are internships that can range between five and 40 hours. Um, they are paid and um, they are professional assignments that you, you can apply and you get the internship and you, as long as you complete the internship by that deadline, uh, the project, complete the project by the deadline, you get paid for completing it. Um, so that's another way of getting some experience and being able to add it to your resume. Um, another great resource is Big Interview, which is available through Handshake. Um, it's an interview prep tool that you can use online. Um, very easy. I've used it myself to prepare for interviews. It's great. Um, and then there's our the link to our website, SCC Career Services. We're located at Student Services East. Um, there's our phone number. Um, and there's a QR code to our location, appointment, and drop-in information. And then here we have uh, the links to the U.S. Um, Citizenship and Immigration Services Department, uh, specifically for students and employment, uh, or students and employment information. Um, and then also information uh, regarding U.S. visas for students from Mexico, and also a link to the SDSU International Affairs Complex. So with that, thank you all so much. Thank you again to our panelists, Natalia, and we'll transition into Q&A. So again, please drop your questions into the Q&A um, section. That's the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
and we'll go ahead, go ahead and get started. And I know you've touched on some of this a little bit already, um, but I want to invite you to elaborate. Um, so, and, and Natalia, you you already answered that first one that we have there. The how did you decide your current career and what you wanted to do? Um, so we'll skip that unless you want to. There's anything else you want to add? Feel free to add. Um, the next question is. What is your advice if you are seeking an internship or job that is completely unrelated to any of the job experience you currently have? Obviously it's hard when you're a student and working nine to five is an ideal as working as a quick, a quick serving or bartending job as I personally do. It's hard to sacrifice that income when you have financial responsibilities, including paying your way through school, but wanting to gain uh, on the field experience and so on and so forth. Uh, we just, Go ahead and answer the question. Yes. I, I totally hear you. Um, and many of us, uh, as I went through college, not myself personally, but many of my classmates, you know, made very good money as bartenders and uh, waitresses and so forth. Um, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. As I said, actually, bartenders become mental health people. Just to show you a real quickie there, mental health individuals have worked the public mental health with bartenders and barbers to help them to get information to the people that need it the most. So that's just a tidbit there of why it does pay off to have those kind of professions and pick up those kind of skills. Um, but, but what you're asking is, what do you do? And what Leticia shared with you earlier is very, very powerful and profound. Yes, you take the job that makes you the most money. So you have to work less hours. Absolutely. Nobody's going to ever say no to that. But you can have hours in other parts of your life where you can volunteer and have that experience. Find them. Look for them. Many people need uh, assistance in many different ways um, from the religious institutions to um the uh, clinics, we in California, as opposed to many other states, especially San Diego, have a tremendous amount of community clinics that would gladly, especially if you're bilingual, but would gladly uh, take on that assistance. Um, the hospitals, hospitals need as many hands on deck as possible. They would gladly work with you for a, a certain amount of hours for you to come in and have that experience, not knowing what it is that you wanna do with your particular career, right? Uh, I can't answer it completely and concise to you know precision, but know that again, do the job that makes you the most money, absolutely. Find the opportunities within your time frame to do the things that are going to give you the exposure and the, the, the visibility of the profession you're seeking. That's in your hands to go and look for them. And don't be afraid to ask. I mean, go to the hospitals, go to the clinics, go to the law offices. If you want to be a lawyer for justice and mental health or a lawyer for public health, go to those environments where you can get them. And Leticia just posted that. I mean, that's worth gold which she's posting for many of you to, to learn and to find a place to volunteer or give time when you have it. Don't overextend. I have to say that as somebody at the university, do not overextend yourself. But Leticia said it well, in order to get to our destiny, there is sacrifice. And many of us have been there. I've done it in different steps than others. And I've done it as a mother with three children and a husband, a full-time job, and I'm still here. I still have my hair, you know, jokingly, but truthfully, and uh, it can be done. Just take care of yourself. That's the important thing, but you can do it. Absolutely, yeah. I have to mirror the same sentiments. Uh, looking for a micro internship or volunteering at singular events where the time mm -hmm. commitment is not so extensive is a great opportunity for you. Getting exposure and volunteering as a research participant, right? Um, volunteering or interning to do some data analysis or data entries, really simple entry-level research projects that you can work on that get you exposure to the language and research, the field, people mm -hmm. who are doing this work, 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be so time consuming, mm -hmm. but again, that exposure, having conversations with people is also so important. Um, and like Leticia posted, a lot of these opportunities are virtual, right? And so little incremental steps that you can take along the way uh, to get involved. We, like Professor or Dr. Sento mentioned, we've all been there. I was a barista when I was in college, not relevant to the work that I do now or my master's degree, but I learned how to train people. I learned really great customer service. I learned how to manage critical situations. I learned how to keep really uh, detailed documentation. Those are relevant no matter where you go. Same with as bartender or food industry or sales, you're learning a lot of those critical skills. Uh, like Dr. Sento mentioned, I know of a movement where the bartenders are taught how to recognize domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And they have specific like angel codes or things like the angel system um, to help identify. That, that is a public health issue. Oh. That is a mental health issue that you as a bartender, as a server, as a salesperson can actively and proactively train yourself in understanding and use that at work. If you recognize, you know, the amount of waste that's happening in your restaurant and you want to try to implement some kind of uh, changes or propose some ideas of how to reduce the amount of waste so that our oceans are cleaner so that our environments are healthier so that our children can grow up without trash. That is also something that you can do in your environments. Karen has a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. Yes. With the ever-changing job market, why or why not would you recommend going to a trade school or getting a degree or vice versa? I, I find that very powerful. Many of my students in child and family development uh, have actually educated me and now I'm putting it out there. Um, many of them say, well, I want to be an occupational therapist. And I say, that's wonderful. It doesn't require a bachelor's degree. However, an occupational therapist works within um, the, the, the hospitals and the clinics. And in order to go up through administration, administrators are going to want somebody that has a college degree. So what we say to them and what many of them have done is they acquire their Bachelor of Science with us in Child and Family Development, and they go to the uh, community college where it is that they can acquire their occupational therapy certification licensure, and now they have both. And they are the ones that then will become the educators of their field and therefore the administrators within the different hospital and clinical settings. Therefore, they can go around the world educating other people about their field of occupational therapy. That's just one tiny example. My RN's the same thing. Not everybody can get into a BSN, but no offense to a BSN. My mother was one. Uh, the whole point that I'm making is a BS with an RN is a BS. <laughs> Joking me tongue in cheek, it is. And so therefore, I have many young men and women that get their BS in science and child and family development, go on to a two-year community college and acquire their registered nurse preparation and go for their boards. And now they're RNs with a BS. You have to know all the multiple ways to be successful. And many of those then go on to become masters in social work licensed clinical social workers, or on to go get a master's in public health, which Leticia would be the perfect person to talk about. These are official or unofficial licensures that no one can take away from you and that people must have on board to do certain things in their uh, agencies. So it's important. Now, I always wanted to carry a badge. I don't want to be a police officer or a detective, but in public health, our public health individuals that give the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's in the restaurants, they have badges <laughs> and they do use them. So there's so many, so many realms of, of possibility of the different fields of mental health professions and public health. And there's many different majors that'll get you to that destination. You just got to find the right one for yourself. Absolutely. Let's see. Yeah, I was wondering if you would want to share about how you made the choice to go into the field first and then later get, get your master's mm -hmm. degree. Mm 
Yeah, thank you, Natalia. That because that is my uh, my path was that I I uh, took some time off. My my bachelor's degree was in psychology, and I really wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with that. And so I decided to take some time to actually just get some real world experience and and start somewhere. And I I really wasn't dead set on anything, which is comes in handy. So my my recommendation there is to stay open minded. Um, as Natalia said before, like getting your foot in the door doesn't mean all the, that you're gonna get have the job of your you know of your life, and that that's the place that you know is you know matches up exactly to what you had in mind. But it is experience, no matter what. It's experience. Now you may end up finding that it's not what you want to do, but that's but the process of elimination is just part of the is part of the process as well. So it's one less thing that you have to worry about, right? One less one uh, direction that you're not going to go into. But um, for me, getting the experience first helped me to really get practice and exposure to a couple of things. My work environment. Am I in my office all day in front of a computer? Or am I walking around interacting with community members and other professionals? Am I driving? Am I traveling? Um, you know, the work environment is huge. So that allowed me to experience and what that was like. The duties. Do I like typing and entering data into a computer? Um, do I like the data analysis of, you know, or, um, you know, uh, making sure that we're, um, you know, all of our data is clean? Or do I like um, actually communicating with the public out at health fairs, you know, sitting at a booth and talking with folks and educating them about our healthcare services? Or do I uh, prefer to answer the phones and, and, and sit in the office? And yes, I have some interaction, but I prefer to have, you know, an office, you know, duties instead. So this is all what you experience if you're working. Um, and it was my experience doing that for a health center, San Isidro Health Center, when I was working for an uh, HIV AIDS program there. And it was during my time there, um, interacting with the community members, getting involved in the health education um, component, that I realized after about six months that this is what I wanted to do. And so it made my decision that much clearer. And I looked and searched for the, for the master's in public health programs uh, throughout the country. And I, because I knew that's what I wanted to do and because I had the experience and the exposure, it made my journey um, that much more meaningful and enjoyable. And it's probably why I'm still in the field today, 20, you know, almost, yeah, 20 years later. So um, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> yes. And, and I will say it's a little bit of an unpopular opinion in higher ed, but I think for some people going into trade school is an amazing opportunity. Not everybody needs to necessarily go to a, get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, depending on what you would like to do, depending on your interests, your day to day. Um, in the US, the trades are actually a profession that you can make a really stable living and contribute to your community. In other countries, that is not always the case. Some, um, what we would consider kind of blue collar work here in the US, you cannot make a living off in other countries. So it really depends on your interests. Do you like fixing problems with your hands and contributing to the function of a facility? Again, you have a lot of options. And it really does take that introspection into yourself in your, what your day-to-day -day would really look like. 
The other piece that I think was probably more uh, of a pressing issue with our current students who are already working on their bachelor's degree is some of you might be asking, should I get a double major? Should I get a minor? Should I get multiple minors? And this is where I would say it is in this market and in the environment that we're in right now, in particular in the US, finding a certificate and gaining a certificate in a particular area of expertise in a specific technology is much more useful and competitive than a minor in some cases. So for example, I see sometimes students who get psychology and sociology double major with a social work minor, right? Very, very similar fields. Instead of having all of those, those expertise in that field, you could have gotten a certificate in Tableau or data analytics or child family development or something relating to leadership, right? And so I think looking at certificates to gain extra knowledge that make you that much more competitive, let's say they don't teach you data analytics or statistics or research in your major, doesn't mean you can't gain that expertise and add that to your resume to make yourself competitive. Competitive. One resource I'm going to post in the chat is called Coursera. You can take online classes and certificates to get training in a particular area. Anything from data to leadership to emotional intelligence to critical thinking to very specific technologies and platforms and softwares. And a lot of them are free or very low cost. They're offered from universities around the world and in multiple different languages. And these are things that help you build a skill set. So in particular for that student who maybe you don't have a lot of time right now to give a lot of, um, of your physical self, you know, in volunteering or internships, look at a certificate. When you have your winter break or summer break, look at a certificate or a micro internship to begin exposing yourself to this knowledge. That way you're competitive to get those internships or part-time jobs in the public health field to learn even more because you have that background knowledge that you've gained in that training. Might, might I add that you want to distinguish yourself and not just San Diego State or uh, UABC, the university right next door, but there are many other universities throughout the world, many students like yourself. So you want to distinguish yourself. What do you have more than they do? What skill, what abilities and certifications definitely make a difference, especially when you're looking for work at a university or in the centers, they look at that. Okay, here's five different students that are all sophomores in whatever major. Ah, but this one has a certificate and knows how to do everything on the whole Microsoft uh, package uh, thing. Oh, this one knows how to do, how to put in data into Excel and make spreadsheets. All of those things will help you while you're in college and afterwards uh, to get good paying jobs when you have those skills. I have to stress that what Natalia said about the community college, the other uh, trade centers, when you combine the power of those skills and those abilities with your degree, a bachelor's, master's and so forth, you are that much more valuable to anybody that's gonna hire you because you, you bring so much to the table and uh, it'll open doors that you can't even imagine. So the more you can put under your belt and do it for free, you don't have to, I mean, a minor that is going to elevate you, absolutely. But you don't have to do that if you go and acquire these type of preparations. You will have that to put on to your resume. So if you don't have a resume, you better start developing one. And we have that at Career Services. Very important. Thank you. Such, such great advice um, and also inspiring. So thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't see any other questions. What's our time frame? Just to make sure we're okay. We have about five minutes. Okay. Well, Leticia shared with you uh, her uh, way of being and how she got to where she is. And she worked first and uh, found her place. I did different than that. 
I and my household being first generation, having some brains up here, the, the coconut uh, was uh, supported and pushed forward that it, we're going to put money into you. You're going to get a job that's going to make us a lot of money to help the family. So I wanted to help people. So I went to medical school. I was going to be a physician. That's all I could think of. Either I don't want to be a lawyer and I don't really want to teach. Isn't that funny? That's what I do now for a living. I teach, but I teach what my field is. The point being that I went and started and did it all. But then guess what? I didn't have the computers and everything that Natalia and Melissa and Leticia has shared with you. I actually had to go to a library when somebody woke me up about public health. I said, what is that? Is that just me going out giving vaccinations? That's what I thought growing up. I thought I had to be an MD to help my community. And then I found public health and I said, hmm. I can help one person at a time every 10 to 15 minutes, or I can help thousands at a time. And uh, were my parents happy? Absolutely not. They were devastated. All that money, they thought that's it, we're done. But I went and got my master's in public health. And what can I tell you? The sky was the limit after I acquired it, the differences that I made in, in my lifetime for my community, for my state, and so forth. So what I'm trying to say to you all is, it's never too late, and there are many paths, and we don't know where we're gonna end up, but all the knowledge I acquired preparing to be a physician at the time, I use to this day, I use it in my life, I use my skills, and then I acquired more degrees and more knowledge to be able to do what I do now professionally. So. You never stop learning and it's never too late when you find your passion and your purpose in life and you stick to it. A little bit of suffering, but it pays off at the end. Gracias. Thank you very much. Any last closing thoughts, Leticia? Um, I put in some links in the chat and these are all free online trainings that you can do. I highly recommend that um, going through and checking them out. This is the exposure I was talking about, you know, just whatever you can do on your own time, um, you can do something. So hopefully this helps. Um, I'm also available. Um, so, you know, if you want to reach out and, and um, you know, have a, an advising session, we can do it virtually. So I am available for, for that. I also wanted to address opportunities um, for those um, that are living in, in Tijuana or Mexico, it, it's, it, I don't have contact information right now, um, but what I wanted to say was there are opportunities that um, are those that where you would be, could be working with both organization, organizations on both sides of the border. So there is a lot of transborder public health work being done. We have a lot of research here at San Diego State in the School of Public Health um, that um, involves research projects um, on both sides of the border. Um, and so I invite you to um, check that out. You can actually easily Google San Diego State Public Health Research um, and you will get taken to um, our website where the research projects are described. So learn a little bit about what we're doing on both sides of the border. Um, you can also um, check with organizations um, in Mexico to, to ask them, what work do you do with um, organizations um, in the United States? And maybe you can get involved, whether it's virtual work or supporting that project in some way um, without necessarily having to you know, come over in person. Um, I think the pandemic has allowed more creativity around this. So I would encourage you to go to your organizations that um, in, the, in the areas that you're interested in and ask them, 
what projects do you do or do you work with um, across the border? Um, but yes, definitely um, there are opportunities there. Thank you. I would just add that I'm in the directory. I tried to, not very technical, but I tried to put my email in there to all of you. And I would say that the best thing to do is to seek out information. And if you can connect and you wish to connect with either one of us, please do so. Um, as far as the work that we do on this side of the border in the United States, I can honestly tell you that even though we have a border, it is very fluid and the information provided here flows very, very quickly and directly across. So when we work with our communities here, our comunidad bilingually uh, and provide them with the most up-to-date information, new ways of thinking, of being, uh, these men and women and children share it with their uh, families and counterparts in Latin America, of course, right across the border in Tijuana and Mexicali. So uh, it is important that we uh, share ourselves to everyone uh, when we can and when we're able to. Uh, but most definitely uh, from our education to our public health, to our mental health, when we share the knowledge, it uh, behooves and benefits us as well as it does our fa families and friends and um, the people across the border. So it's very important that we work together. Well, on that note, Thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you to our panelists for sharing all of the amazing wisdom of your years of experience. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at Career Services if you are at San Diego State. Um, also feel free to reach out to the panelists and check out their bios on the website and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Mil gracias. Thank you.